This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Now we're going to look at some aspects of the uh, management of relationships within the supply chain, typically the relationship between the purchaser and their supplier. And the first thing we look at is really just a kind of a definition or a description. Uh, what many um, manufacturers are looking for now is lean synchronization. And in some sense, we, we've talked about this a little bit uh, already when looking at uh, just in time and uh, some of the modern, uh, particularly computerized techniques. Uh, uh, and what lean synchronization really means is that products and services are always delivered exactly as specified, exactly to what customers want, in exact quantities and at the required time and place of delivery. Uh, and this is obviously very high quality. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination. It takes a lot of cooperation uh, between all the various uh, sections of a supply chain. Remember how this is uh, different to uh, traditional manufacturing. Uh, traditional manufacturing tended to have inventory. Inventory was there as a buffer, as a kind of safety stock in case something went wrong with the, the kind of synchronization or the manufacturing. It had relatively slow throughput times. Uh, it meant that if you ordered something from a supplier and they didn't have it in stock, well, maybe they're in the middle of making a large batch of a different product, maybe you had to wait for them. They weren't very responsive, uh, weren't very flexible. And also the uh, uh, old form of uh, really supply chain management, less flexibility uh, because uh, to change production quickly because buffer inventories have to be held for even longer. Uh, so we have a lot of inventory, a lot of buffer inventories with large batches being made and so on uh, and not very responsive to customers' requirements. Now, supply chain uh, relationship management or SRM is concerned, as it says here, with the management of the supplier relationship. Uh, this involves managing the interfaces between the organizations supplying goods and or services to an organization in order to maximize their value. It is about building relationships that work towards supporting an effective financially beneficial environment for everyone in the supply chain. And we'll see that uh, what of, uh, a lot of uh, supply chain relations management gets away from uh, is what might be called a kind of slightly old-fashioned relationship, a slightly uh, uh, confrontational uh, relationship where there was a supplier, uh, there was a purchaser, uh, and they were kind of a, a, a little bit of uh, at loggerheads, really. Uh, the purchaser wanted to get every cent possible away from the purchase price. The supplier wanted to add money on and so there's a lot of hard bargaining where it would take place. And if you weren't uh, careful, although they see uh, the purchaser might get the cost minimized, uh, then the supplier to you know make a decent profit uh, might end up not being as responsive or maybe uh, skimping in quality and so on. So a lot of this kind of confrontational uh, approach uh, many companies have tried to get away from uh, and ultimately they realize that they're all in it together. Uh, the supplier needs a manufacturer, but a manufacturer also needs a supplier. Uh, and only by together managing to produce uh, goods that the final consumer wants are both of them going to profit in the long term. So here uh, we have uh, some of the different models or different sorts of relationships that there might be uh, between suppliers and purchasers. Transactional, uh, and contractual, value-added, collaborative and partnership. And as we go down uh, this here, we're getting uh, further and further away from this uh, confrontational uh, me versus you sort of situation to a partnership where we're all in it together for a mutual benefit. Think of a transactional as a once-off transaction. A single transaction you buy once from a supplier 
Uh, in many ways, they don't expect ever to see you again. You don't really expect to see them again. Uh, the exchange of uh, services or products uh, within an agreed time scale at an agreed price. Uh, so all you're ever going to make in this as a supplier is this once-off possibility of profit. And you may as well, in many ways, uh, go all out to get the maximum possible price from the buyer and maybe uh, produce uh, products of the minimum acceptable quality because you're not you've got no ambitions for an ongoing relationship slightly better than that is maybe a contractual re relationship uh, but it is built uh, rather more around delivering the terms of a contract uh, here there, there might be a small contract but not a lot of time is really spent on it you may not even know the person very well uh, with whom you're, you're dealing here but here there's been some negotiation uh, over a contract on prices, quality, delivery times, and so on there. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit more formalized, so it is. And the contract might last for a, a period of time during which there are several deliveries. Value-added relationships. This is usually adopted by suppliers, the sellers, uh, when they move to a strategy to retain customers. Uh, so what we want to do here is to build more of an ongoing relationship with our customers that they will want to come back to us, that they will see it's worthwhile uh, come, coming back to us. And of course, one of the ways that you can do this is you develop special or customized solutions to meet your customers' needs. So the customer wants to switch somewhere else, is what's called a switching cost. They have to find someone else and maybe train someone else to deliver the product uh, to their specification. So think back to the value chain when you see this value added here. The value chain says uh, people come to us, people allow us to make profits because we, we are doing something which they value and which either they can't do themselves or don't want to do themselves. So here the supplier is thinking how can I do something which is really valued by the customer so they will keep coming back. The next one is a collaborative relationship, a close working together uh, between the two parties in here, which is going to deliver value and benefits to both uh, parties, to both organizations. And what they might have here is actually the really collaborating uh, jointly in the development of a new product. Uh, so the supplier develops a special component uh, this is incorporated into the new product. Uh, both uh, new product sells well, we hope, uh, but both parties can, in a way, benefit from this collaboration which has taken place. The supplier is putting in a lot of expertise, a new component. The, uh, the, the, the manufacturer, the people who assemble the components, uh, are maybe using their marketing expertise to sell this uh, component. And together, they make more profits than they could separately. And finally, there is the partnership uh, relationships. It is a collaborative relationship, plus uh, perhaps a little bit more going on here. I think maybe the, the idea is that there's more long-term, more permanence in this sort of relationship if you see yourself as a partner with a supplier. Be very different, very different relationship to the first one we had, this contractual one or the transactional one uh, there. In the transactional relationship, if I supply something to somebody, and let's say they, they think there's a, a fault in it, then they will really come at me to try and get compensation and to try to get uh, you know, credit for, for bad workmanship and uh, so on. They'll really take me to, to task on it. By the time you get to partnership, however, if I make an error in manufacturing a component, it's supplied to my customer, the customer spots the error, it's not then the customer saying, well, how much are you going to compensate me for? It's rather both parties saying, look, we're in this together. Uh, there's no point in me making inferior components. Uh, I want to stop doing that. And the uh, assembly, the, the, the person who's making the goods, who's buying my defective goods, says there's no point in you supplying with me with these defective goods. Let's see how we can work together to make sure there are no mix-ups in the orders to make sure that the uh, components which are supplied are going to be 
adequate for the purpose. Uh, both people understand that it is to their mutual benefit that good products come out of the supply chain. Next, uh, we have just a little bit of uh, definition here, uh, uh, materials resource planning or MRP. Uh, materials resource planning, we've really in a way talked about it when we talked about Dell. If you remember, we said in, in Dell, they get these orders coming in from the internet. Every half hour, they consolidate the orders uh, and they know exactly what materials, what components are needed uh, to build the machines that were being ordered. And that's essentially materials resource planning. It uses sales orders and sales forecasts uh, to schedule the purchase and delivery of raw materials. It's sometimes known as MRP1, that is one, uh, because there's another uh, type of planning, uh, which is manufacturing resources planning, which is called MRP2, both are MRP. But in manufacturing resources planning, not only are you going to be scheduling and planning the receipt of raw materials, you're also going to be scheduling people's time and the use of machinery and other resources in the organization. So all of the resources needed for manufacturing are planned in this rather more sophisticated system. Statistical process control. Uh, we'll be getting on very soon to be looking at uh, quality uh, control. And statistical uh, uh, process control is one way of monitoring quality uh, and taking action whenever we think it's needed. So let's say that what we have is a very simple operation, uh, that we have uh, a metal bar, uh, for example, and a machine has to cut that to a very precise light, uh, length, let's say a, a meter. Now, by and large, depending on the accuracy of the machine and how good it is and so on, uh, as you cut one bar after the other, the, the actual lengths of the bar are likely to maybe jiggle about a little bit. Now, uh, machines have got little faults in them. It may even depend on the temperature of the factory and so on. Uh, when the, 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 the cut is being made, exactly how long the, the nominal meter is. So what we can do here, as this machine is kind of slicing through the metal into what it thinks is a meter, uh, what we can do is we can actually measure uh, the length of the bars which are being produced. And provided it kind of jiggles about within a certain limits, we're not going to be worried. It could be our purchaser has said, it could be a meter plus or minus half a millimeter or something of that sort, and anything within that range is fine for us. So we, and we keep monitoring, we don't know if it's doing it right unless we monitor it. A lot of quality control is, is taking readings, statistical readings, and trying to draw conclusions from it. But then suddenly we begin to see at, at one point that the uh, length of metal that we're cutting gets longer and longer and at some point we're going to say right uh, no more uh, we have reached what is called a, a kind of control limit this will be the upper control limit as a cutoff point and we say any more than that we can't really tolerate that we're no longer kind of jiggling about at random that maybe something on the machine has slipped something has gone wrong in the manufacturing process and once we get out of this tolerance level, we have to stop the machines, we have to reset it, we have to investigate, uh, we reset it off again and see if we're back within the uh, tolerance level. So data that falls within the control limits indicates that everything is fine and that the small variations uh, are just due to random natural variations and so on there. Once we go outside the control limits, then thinking something has gone wrong, uh, and this is the point where we must take action. Now this is to do with uh, quality. Uh, and quality has become extremely important in manufacturing. Uh, quality to some extent was uh, something, if not quite invented by the Japanese, was some, certainly something which in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the Japanese began to kind of conquer the manufacturing world. 
uh, because the the cars they produced were of uh, very good quality, very reliable. Of course, they're very famous for their electronics, uh, Sony, Toshiba, and so on. Uh, cameras, of course, very precise precision instruments with great lenses and so on. And they kind of, for a while, swept the world in front of them with uh, good quality. Uh, and perhaps rather belatedly, uh, Western industries have caught up with this. Uh, but now we all realize that good quality is important. If we can't supply good quality, then our customers are not going to tolerate it and they're going to go somewhere else. And we start off with a couple of definitions of quality. Uh, and here we have this uh, writer called Duran, uh, who has defined quality as fitness for use. Uh, and fitness for use is really in the hands of the user, the customer, if you like. That is a person who knows whether the uh, camera which they have, or the uh, audio recorder which they have, or the, the, the headphones which they buy and so on, are good enough for them. Uh, no one else can really define that because, of course, we know there's a vast range in how good things are. And we're not saying cheap things are bad quality as such, uh, which we're kind of more saying that something is of uh, good quality if it doesn't tell you lies, if for the money you've paid for it you don't feel that you've been cheated. And then we have uh, from the ISO 9000 handbook, the ISO is International Standards Organization here, again the ability to satisfy customers stated or implied needs. But again, very much, the emphasis here is put on its good quality of the customer or the user or the consumer believes it to be good quality or regards it as being good quality. There is therefore no absolute level of quality. It is to do with kind of setting out your store and saying, you know, this is what you're getting if you pay this amount of money. Quality control is uh, all the processes which are used by organizations uh, to try and ensure that the items coming off the production line are of the stated quality which is going to please the consumers. Uh, so the quality control processes, if you like, uh, which is sampling, testing and so on. When do you sample? How many do you take? At what stages do you... Uh, do you uh, uh, test and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a way in which quality can be imposed on the manufacturing process. You can't just hope for quality. Quality assurance is the sum of uh, the, the management uh, uh, that allows you opportunity to dependently uh, achieve a certain level of quality. So quality assurance here. Uh, for example, you might say uh, that the failure rate is one in a million. So you're, you're saying that to your customers, failure rate is one in a million. Uh, how do we know that? How can we prove to our customers uh, that we have processes in place which can in a way guarantee that the failure rate is going to be no more than one component out of a million? Uh, and that is the quality assurance. That is the sum of all the uh, quality control processes and the management overseeing those processes and so on, uh, ensuring that you know, maybe statistical control is there to, to, to look for items wandering outside the quality and so on. That's quality assurance. And then quality management is overseeing all of the activities uh, needed to achieve and retain and maintain the required quality setting and ensuring that the quality control procedures and so on are there uh, and also considering quality improvement. Now when uh, high quality uh, was okay it was adopted maybe first by the Japanese uh, but then uh, Western firms began to look at the success of Japanese industry uh, and, and for a long time Western companies equated building better quality in that, into their products with incurring more costs in the manufacturing of their products. 
And so they were reluctant to do that. They kind of shied away from quality because he thought high quality means high costs. And high costs mean uh, that we're going to be hurting our profits. Now, uh, it took uh, some of the management writers, one of the management writers in particular, uh, came out with a, a startling phrase at the time, which said that quality is free. Quality is free. Uh, and this uh, kind of took everyone back a little bit surprised. How can improving the quality of your output possibly be free? And the explanation that was used is, is, is this here. Let's say you had no quality control processes at all, no quality assurance, no quality management in place at all. Uh, you produced goods and they went to the customer without any sort of testing or verification. And the customer on packs the goods, switches on, let's say it's a television, uh, and a lot of the time it's not going to work. And that is uh, external failure costs. Uh, it happens with the customer, basically. Now that is fantastically expensive uh, because you've really irritated that customer. They maybe will never come back to you. Uh, you have to take the goods back into the factory, you probably have to replace them with new goods at the customer. When you bring the goods back into the factory, uh, it may be very difficult to repair the goods because we you know depending on the way they've been constructed and then you know the parts joined together, uh, it may be very difficult to find the, the reason for the fault. So that's really expensive. Then he said, right, you don't do any quality control except uh, we're making these televisions at the very last stage when it's finished, you turn it on and you let it run for a couple of hours to heat up and so on. Uh, and you see if it works. And some of them, of course, will not work, or they will work for a while and then they will stop working. That's what's called internal failure costs. The thing doesn't work, but at least we've discovered that internally. Now that is going to be a cheaper way of dealing with quality because you haven't done any damage to the customer, you haven't irritated the customer, you haven't sent goods out and have to send them back and so on. So if you were just to spend a little bit of money doing this testing at the end of the production, you would save money compared to doing no testing. However, you've got a complete TV there that doesn't work. You still have to take it apart. You still have to try and find why it doesn't work, what component is wrong. They said, well, why don't you, as a TV, goes to each part of the production line and a new component is added at each part of the production line, why don't you test it after each stage? So if it works there and it doesn't work there, then it's this last step and this last component probably where the quality problem is. So you found the nature of the error, you discovered it earlier on. You don't have to take a whole TV apart, you can just repair it there and then. That's presumably going to be even cheaper than doing that. And finally, they say, it's going to be cheapest of all if you put a lot of effort into preventing anything going wrong. Uh, and preventing anything going wrong starts right at the design phase. So if you're designing a piece of electronics uh, and you expect this bit of wire you know, to usually take one amp of current and so on, uh, why don't you put in a bit of wire maybe that takes 1.5 amps? Uh, so even if it, you know, there'd be a bit of tolerance in there, you know, it's 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 unlikely to burn out with that extra 50% and so on. Uh, make sure that your uh, suppliers supply goods of, again, very high quality because you can't make good products if you're putting in rubbish type of components. So make sure they supply good components to you. If you're designing something, let's say a plug has to go in uh, to uh, uh, an element in, in the TV. Well, why don't you design the, the, the plug and the sockets? You can only put it in one way, that it will simply not go in the other way. And if you design it so it will only go in one way, then you're preventing a, a misconnection. Train people well. Uh, training is very important in uh, these prevention costs. And they say basically that if you put a lot of money in at this stage here, uh, this is going to be actually less money 
than what will be incurred there if you do no quality at all and everything goes wrong in the hands of the consumer. A very powerful argument for bringing forward the effort in ensuring that quality is good. Now this idea uh, led to uh, the concept and the culture of total quality management. Uh, and it's worth just reading what the definition of total quality management is here. It's the continuous improvement in quality, productivity and effectiveness obtained by established management responsibility for processes as well as output. In this, every process has an identified process owner, in other words, someone to take responsibility for it, someone to take blame uh, if the process doesn't go well, and every person in the entity operates within a process and contributes to its improvement. And improvement is one of the things, continual improvement is one of the things about total quality management, which means that if improvement, you never you never get to the promised land, you never get to perfection really, that there's an element of being unsatisfied, uh, of continual questing for improvements, of never putting up with something, never tolerating something that would be improved here. Uh, it, it does mean it's never really kind of uh, completed uh, when you get to uh, to that. So uh, this uh, here, this uh, uh, Continual improvement really means that the process of total quality management never completes and it requires very much a culture in the organisation, as I say, never being satisfied, never saying it's good enough, uh, never being uh, uh, happy that we've reached the uh, level of perfection. And what it looks for, uh, generally, is a continuous series of small improvements and a Japanese term for that is Kaizen. So you think of yourself as kind of slowly, finger hole by finger hole, little by little, with great patience, every year, every month, improving uh, the quality of what's occurring in the organization. The uh, total quality management here isn't just to do with production, and that's obviously very important, uh, but it means everything happening in the organization. Uh, so organizations who have embraced total quality management uh, will say something like maybe the phones have to be answered within three rings. Uh, if the person asks a query, you have to be able to put it through to, to the right person. You have to know who can deal with that query and so on. Uh, if you say something's going to be delivered in three days, it will be delivered in three days. Uh, if you issue invoices, the invoices have to be precise and, and so on. So every interaction of the consumer with the organization is of the highest possible quality. Another quality initiative uh, is called Six Sigma. Now this is uh, an approach that was uh, originally uh, invented by Motorola. Motorola makes uh, electronic circuits, these very you know, microprocessors and so on, that are used in computers and phones and all sorts of larger electronic products. Uh, and they were uh, concerned that uh, obviously these, these microprocessors are very much the heart of the uh, product. Uh, and if you put in defective microprocessors, the things simply won't work. And, and it's very expensive to, to kind of put right and so on. Uh, so they were interested in getting very low rejection rates. Okay, they had an ambition of that. Now, I wouldn't worry too much about that because we said there's no ultimate test of quality. Uh, if you're making cups, uh, then the quality doesn't have to be quite so high uh, as maybe if you're making a component for a jet airliner. Uh, because if a cup gets you know, slight flaw and a glaze, it's not going to really do anybody any harm. Uh, but if a part falls off a jet airliner or breaks, then of course many people could be could be killed and so on. So we want to get away maybe from from uh, you know this absolute idea of uh, where the, the quality should should be, but we're looking for very low rejection rates, uh, moving towards very low rejection rates, and there's an element of kaizen in this again, continual improvement. 
And Six Sigma uh, uh, basically came out with a methodology for, for doing this called Damiac. And the first uh, element here was to define, define what is meant by quality. Uh, is it uh, the weight? Is it the failure rate? Is it it has to be of a very precise colour? Uh, is it that the goods have to be always delivered within an hour of being uh, ordered or something of that type? Uh, different products, different services. Uh, when you say they're quality products or quality services, uh, people understand or, 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 or have different things at the front of their minds is defining quality. So we must understand what's meant by quality and in particular what consumers mean by high quality. And then what we want to do is to measure uh, how well we're doing that at the moment. So if the quality is always being able to deliver within an hour, we want to start measuring you know, what proportion of uh, orders are delivered within an hour, with what proportion are delivered within 70 minutes, etc., etc. Uh, if we're looking at the, you know, cutting our iron beam always to be a meter, and it mustn't be longer than 1.1, you know, one or one meter, one millimeter, uh, then we would have to be uh, uh, measuring how many of these meter beams were supposed to be cutting are actually outside the tolerance. And then we, what uh, we have to do is we say, right, why might that be? Why are we uh, uh, sending out goods late 5% uh, you know, of the time? What are the problems in production or packaging or delivery which makes these goods late? Or if we, we're talking about our iron bar, we have to say, well, how come the machine you know, makes you know, 5% out of the tolerance and so on. What, 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 what is the reason for this? And once we've analysed or think we've analysed the purpose, the reason for being outside the tolerance, then what we can do is we can have a strategy for improving it. We say, right, uh, we're late on these deliveries and we're right late on these deliveries uh, because there's something gone wrong with the logistics firm. Maybe what we should do is to use two logistics companies, one which is very good maybe in the south of the country, one which is very good in the north of the country, uh, and we'll split our orders and give them to the people who can deal with them best. Or in our machine, maybe what we have to say is, maybe we need a new machine, or maybe we need it to be uh, overhauled and serviced and so on. Maybe that will solve this uh, quality problem. And basically what you do is you go around again, so we put through these uh, improvements we hope are going to work and you go around this cycle and you measure uh, again how are we doing now? Have we cut down the late deliveries? Are we within the stated uh, proportion of late deliveries that we're willing to tolerate and so on? And maybe we have to analyse a bit more because we're not there yet and try a, a second additional improvement and so on. So gradually, maybe by a number of different steps, uh, we get towards the required level of quality. Over all of this, and the C part of it here is control. Okay, uh, There is going to be time and money spent on getting the quality improved. And there may be some cases where we have to say, maybe we have to go to the consumer and say, look, uh, we could get the quality up, but it's going to cost an awful lot of money getting the quality up. Uh, simply because of the nature of the production process or the uh, the nature of the geography of the country. It's going to be very difficult to get products reliably to you in the stated time. Uh, and we have to keep an eye you know, on what the customer is willing to pay uh, and maybe what we are willing to invest in, in getting to the stated level of quality that we're aiming for. Maybe what we have to do is go back a little bit uh, and sometimes we might actually say, well, mm, maybe we've uh, bitten off more than we can chew. Maybe what we have to do, provided the customer will live with it, maybe what we have to do is actually bring down our ambitions a little bit uh, rather than spending huge amounts of money, which are actually going to maybe bring relatively small benefits. We can get to where you want to be, but is it really worthwhile? Uh, you know, changing the rejections from you know six per thousand to five per thousand 
if it's going to cost an awful lot of money to be doing that. So as I said, there is an element of uh, Demiak uh, there, of Kaizen there within this, this idea of a, an iterative process where you go around looking for improvements. Reverse logistics. Uh, reverse logistics, a very uh, specific term, refers to all operations related to the reuse of products and materials. Uh, and this, uh, you know, gets feeds into, to some extent, the sustainability, the triple bottom line, where we had environmental or ecological uh, considerations and maybe social considerations uh, here. Uh, it's looking at, uh, for example, uh, basically it's disposal, I suppose, most of it. What happens a product when it's finished? Or maybe what happens a product if it goes to a customer and doesn't work, how are we going to get it back and repaired so the whole thing doesn't have to be kind of thrown away? That is reverse logistics as well. Uh, so it includes uh, the management and sales of surplus as well as uh, returned equipment and so on. So here we have uh, examples of uh, wanting to manage the reverse logistics. So. A product is defective, where we know it shouldn't be defective, uh, ideally if we've, we've spent enough money on preventing things going wrong here, but from time to time things are uh, defective. Uh, how are we going to organise getting the product back from the customer, testing it, dismantling it, repairing it, or maybe scrapping it and then and recovering certain valuable products from it if we do indeed have to scrap it? How can we dispose of it safely? if it has to be scrapped. And management needs to think about this. Uh, Amazon's quite good at it. If Amazon sells you a product that doesn't work, uh, they will send you an email, you can print out a label, and you package your product, you put a label on, and you can leave this off in a whole lot of places over town. And it goes back to Amazon kind of free of charge. The label says who's, it's, who's from, and they know it's from me, etc., etc. Uh, and in fact, before they uh, even receive the defective unit back, they will have dispatched a new one to me. Uh, so they have that really worked out and, and, and people realize that uh, there's no risk involved really in buying from Amazon. If the product doesn't work, you're going to get another one even before you send the old one back. So they thought about those logistics very carefully. At the end of a product's life, uh, for example, uh, in laser printers, there are these quite large cartridges they are precision made, uh, a lot of quite kind of valuable materials in there and, uh, and so on. Uh, they can be sent back to the manufacturer, they can be clean, polished, whatever needs to be happened, they can be refilled with a toner and, and so on. And then maybe at the end of a product's life. Uh, mobile phones, for example, have a very a high proportion of valuable, what are called rare earth metals in them. Uh, for uh, the circuits, the screen, uh, magnetics, and, and, and so on there. Uh, there's a lot that can be usefully recovered from those phones, and far better to the environment in recovering these useful and rare elements than just throwing the whole phone away or um, incinerating it or something of that sort where everything's going to be uh, wasted. So manufacturers, if they want to embrace this triple bottom line, do need to think about these reverse logistics. Fixing products, dealing with products, the disposal of products at the end of their life, uh, and uh, also uh, maybe being able to refurbish and reuse those products to get a kind of second life out of them as well, uh, to cut down the amount of wastage.